guy walk in and he was high and tight, man. He had that pressed uniform on. His hair was neatly trimmed. And man, he looked like somebody. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm nobody. And I wanted so desperately to be somebody. You know, it's like I just, I don't want to be another punk or another bum from the projects. I don't want to be a guy that just gets a second-rate job that's drinking and partying with his friends, hanging out at the, the, the taverns and the bars and just living some meaningless life. I started talking to him. He told me I had to lose a few pounds to get in, so I started running with a trash bag. My brother still laughs at me because I used to run around the park with a trash bag to lose weight. It's 1995. I joined the United States Army. I became an M1A1 tanker. I was uh, spent basic training in Fort Knox, Kentucky, uh, Disney Barracks, uh, for 13 weeks. And then uh, shortly after basic, I was stationed at Fort Hood, Texas. No good Fort Hood. Mm-hmm. The armpit of Texas. Home of the Apache. Oh, yeah. This is where it really gets interesting. <laughs> the second night that I'm in Texas, when you first get into the military, you fly in and they after when you get brought to your duty station, they have this thing called 21st Replacement. And they put you in this holding area till they disperse you out into your units, what unit you're going to be in, what, what uh, barracks you're going to be at, what company you're going to be at. So I'm there with a bunch of guys. We don't even know if we're going to be in the same unit. We don't even know where we're going. You could tell we were newbies because we had our dog tags on. And that was one of the ways you could identify guys that had just gotten there, guys that always wore their dog tags. I'm sure, Ken, you know what I'm talking about. You, you were in the service. Uh, any of you guys ever been to service? No. So you could you could you could see us a mile coming from a mile away. You could hear us. You could hear, hear us. Hear clink, 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 yeah. clink, clink. And uh second day that I'm there, my t- two guys that I'd met, we went over to the mall. We had taken a taxi. They ripped us off because that's what they do. They take it a long way and rip you off because you're a newbie. You don't know any better. You're paying twenty dollars to go to the mall, which is, you know, three miles down the road. You know, right right off the right off base. <laughs> We were in the mall just messing around, acting stupid. We go into this toy store, and we're messing around. And I meet this girl, and uh, her name was Sarah. First girl I met when I went to Texas. The bad part is that she was married. She's married to another soldier. And we had, she had offered to give us a ride back to the base. said, look, you guys are getting ripped off. I'll give you guys a ride, you know. But I want to stop and get something to eat first. And my two buddies are sitting there with their tongues hanging out and they're panting over her. And I'm just like, I'm all set, you know. Because, again, like I said, I come from New England and we're cocky. We're arrogant and confident. We don't we don't we don't roll like that. We don't walk around (laughs) with our tongues hanging out. And I guess there was something about the fact that I walked with that type of bravado that attracted her. And she was very drawn to me. And so she pursued me very heavily. And at first I told her, look, you know, you're married. I'm not interested. You know, we can be friends. That's it. Needless to say, the, the pursuit continued, and I didn't make the best of choices. You, which, weren't, you weren't like a Joseph. You know, like, no, I was just going to say. I, I, didn't, I didn't run like uh, Joseph. You didn't leave didn't, your coat behind. Yeah, I didn't run like Joseph. And, uh, yeah, I should have. Because she uh, later had adopted the nickname Psycho Sarah. <laughs> But she ended up uh, she ended up leaving her husband, and then I was stuck with her for about a year and a half. Uh, she was uh, a very volatile relationship, very volatile, um, very insecure, very jealous, very you know, not on my part, but on her part. And uh, this is the other part that gets to me. I got her pregnant too. What happened on that deal was is that. She had lied to me about some things, about her physically, told me that she couldn't have children. Um, Matter of fact, she actually went into the the degree of crying and sobbing over it. And Again, you're young and you're stupid and you think, well, hey, if you can't have kids, why are we using protection? Mm -hmm. And then you get stupid and next thing you know, she's she's pregnant. And I was very angry. I felt like I was – I felt like I was – lied to I felt like I was betrayed and I really didn't walk it out the way that I should have because I basically told her that you know I would 
deal with my responsibilities as, as a father, but as far as her and I were concerned, the relationship was over, uh, that I would, didn't want anything to do with her, that for her to, to lie to me about something like that or, or to, to manipulate me into believing that and then for something like this to happen. Uh, and again, not the wisest of decisions, not the best way to walk something out. She, she ended up getting an abortion because of that, because I told her I wouldn't stick by her. And I can remember before she left, I had had a change of heart. I was like, man, I don't want to do this again, man. And I was like, all this time in my life, I didn't have God in my life. You know, I was just living, surviving. And, but I knew it was wrong in my heart. I knew it was wrong. And I just said, look, you don't have to do this. And she said, no, I want to. I want to get on with my life. I want to go to college, and I don't want to be. So she went through with it. Well, we went through with it. I'm not going to say she went through with it because that's, that's a chicken way out. That's a coward's way out. I basically violated her and her trust when it came to that, and I didn't man up. I didn't man up when I should have. And as a result of that, you know, it ended up happening, and uh, we ended up splitting up, and she did end up going off to college. And then I ended up going out clubbing and partying and drinking and carousing and beating this woman and that woman and this woman and that woman and putting notches in my belt and thinking that I was something special. And, you know, for a long time you think in the military it's it's all about how many beers you can drink and how many girls you can hook up with, you know. And you just wake up empty. You wake up with a sick empty feeling in your stomach thinking why am I doing this you know this is just and this went on for about a year and a half I dated a few other girls a couple ones I got a little serious with it didn't work out and I had this roommate his name was Compa his last name his name was Louis Compagnia he was a Christian and I can remember him reading his Bible in our room and I can remember secretly inside myself saying Man, I wish I had that kind of strength or that kind of faith or that kind of courage. Because, you see, throughout my entire life, I'd always believed in God. I mean, I can remember getting into arguments with my friends because the majority were atheists. And I was ready to fist fight people over the fact that there was a Jesus. I had no idea why. I didn't really go to church. I didn't, you know, didn't give my life to Christ. But I, I believed that he was real. I believed that there was a God. I certainly wasn't living by it. Obviously, you've heard the majority of my story, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always admired him. I always remembered his name. And I always made an impression on me. Like, I, I, wish, I, I wish I had that kind of guts, you know? But I didn't. I was a punk. I mean, I was hurt. I was damaged. I hate to use the term because I hate using it now, but I was wounded. And I was at a point where I just didn't care. You know, I was going to do what I was going to do. And as long as I wasn't physically hurting somebody or forcing myself. See, you, you go through these motions and these thoughts in your head that, you know, hey, I'm going to be, I'm straight up with these girls. I'm telling them, hey, you know, I'm not looking for a relationship. You know, I'm being honest. There's no lies. There's no manipulation, you know. And so you, you the enemy, I look back on it now, the enemy feeds you all this bogus Information where you feel confident and you feel good about it, like, hey, she knew what she was getting herself into. You know, you know, I, I didn't manipulate her. I didn't lie to her. I didn't, you know, put out some false pretenses. I was straight up about it. And then I met Candy. And you know, when you're sitting around with your friends and you're talking about how many women you slept with, it's you feel like, yeah, you've done something. You think it's funny or you think that you've put enough notches in your belt like you're impressing your friends. But when you look at somebody you're in love with and you have respect for, it's not that cool anymore, you know? <laughs> it just... Candy was the first woman in my life that I ever... And this sounds awful when I'm about to say this, but this is the truth. That in the back of my mind, I wasn't just saying, you know, just shut up and take your clothes off. Because to me, women at that point in my life, they were just an object. I'd been hurt by my mother. I'd been hurt by the first love of my life. You know, I'd been hurt by, you know, my father's, uh, you know, wives. 
So I really didn't have a great deal of respect for women. I really didn't. And I certainly didn't want one telling me what to do or telling me what was up. I had a real issue with that. But when I met Candy, I don't know, some just clicked and I was like, I was really impressed with the way that she talked about her family. Because family was always important to me. Even though my parents, you know, there's distance there, but I have brothers that I'm really close to that we grew up tight-knit, you know. And, Mike, you know what I'm talking about in Northeast. I can say whatever I want and do whatever I want to my brother, but if you touch my brother or my sister, it's 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 a bad bad day. Mm-hmm. And well, I can tell just, you're passionate about it because even before we started the, the broadcast, he was saying, you know, I need to talk about some things concerning my parents. And, mm-hmm. you know, that was the first thing that came out of your mouth tonight. And I found that to be very impressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I just, you know, I, when I met Candy, she was she was all about family. And she had already had a, 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 a job. She'd already been established. She certainly didn't need me for anything. We started dating, and she introduced me to it was kind of ironic how things happened. You know, when I first started dating Candy, the first year that we spent Christmas together, her granny had passed away on December 20th, 1997. And uh, I had gone to Oklahoma to visit her and spend Christmas with her. And I remember her pastor, and his name is Gerald Jocelyn. He, uh, he, had, given him seri- he had given a message at her funeral, and he had talked about uh, a new life. And he talked about he had talked about her granny who had been ailing her entire life with a bad leg, a bad hip, and everything. And he had said, "I would imagine Rosemary's got to the gates of heaven, and she took off running. She ain't stopped yet with her new leg and her new body." It was the first time in my life that I wasn't afraid to die. I'd had a new perspective on death. You know, I was like. This doesn't seem right. Most funerals I go to, people are crying. It's a bad mm-hmm. deal. This thing here is, it's giving you hope. It's talking about a place that's far greater than this, and it's talking about a new life and a new beginning. And so that was kind of stirring inside of me. Christmas Eve, midnight, 1997. I'm sitting in my wife's, my now wife's church. At a candlelight ceremony for Christmas. They did it every year. And I remember sitting there and I'm looking at Candy and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, if she's only known half the things I've done, half the places I've been, she wouldn't even be with me right now. And I said to myself, man, John, you have got to change your life. And I looked at her and I said, you know, I really want to find God in my life, and I want you to find him with me. And she said, yeah, me too. I'd gone back and forth there visiting for a period of time. You see, I I knew I was going to marry Candy after the first time I ever met her. And Can I throw something in there real quick on that? I have no idea how he knew that because he was batting way out of his ball field <laughs> just throwing it out yeah she was definitely out of my league <laughs> my wife was definitely out of my league i would go back and forth to the church with her and i told her about how i wanted to give my life to christ and it's kind of funny i look back on it now they had an invitation time and every time the time would come for an invitation i would freeze and i would lock up And I told her, I said, every time that happens, I lock up, I freeze, I lock up. And I said, I just don't know when I'm supposed to go do it. And quite honestly, at that point in time, I didn't realize that when she went forward, you give your life to Christ, you're going to get baptized. I didn't know that. (laughs) So she she told me, she said, well, I'll tell you when it's time. She looked at me one Sunday and she said, it's time. You want me to go with you? And I said, no, I think I can handle this. (laughs) And I, uh, I walked up there and. You know, here I am thinking, you know, we're just going to talk about it. They bring me back to this baptistry, and I'm thinking, hey, I'm here. Let's just do it, you know. I was baptized, (laughs) gave my life to Christ, and uh, Gerald Jocelyn baptized me, and and he married Candy and I. We'd gone through marital counseling with one another. And I'll tell you, he told me, he taught me so much in that short period of time. He said to me, he said, John, you know, if you do everything in your power to make Candy happy, 
and she does everything in her power 